In an earlier video, we saw that having a higher grip strength was associated with a lower risk of death for all causes, or ACM risk. And that's what we'll see here. So this is a meta-analysis of 42 studies that included more than 3 million people. On the y-axis, we've got the hazard ratio of all-cause mortality, or risk of death for all causes, plotted against grip strength in kilograms. In terms of what's significant, we put up a red line at a hazard ratio of 1, and note that where the dashed black lines, this is the 95% confidence interval, if that's completely below that hazard ratio of 1, we have a significant association. And we can see that that's true for all grip strength values greater than about 10 kilograms with the greatest association or the greatest risk reduction or association with reduced risk of death for all causes being at a grip strength greater than 54 kilograms, which was associated with a 65% reduced risk of death. Similarly, a higher VO2 max is associated with a reduced all-cause mortality risk, and that's what we'll see here. So in this study, which included about 750,000 people, also relatively large, we saw that having a VO2 max of 50 was associated with a 76% reduced risk of death for all causes when compared with the lowest VO2 max group that had a VO2 max of 16. Now, an underrated component of fitness is flexibility. And whole body flexibility is also associated with a reduced risk of death for all causes. So the first question is then, how was flexibility evaluated? And that's what we can see with this list of 20 different movements. This is the flex index, which is a body flexibility index, which looked at range of motion or ROM for 20 different movements, which included all of the major joints, including the ankle, knee, hip, trunk, wrist, elbow, and shoulder. And then each of these 20 movements, and I'll put screenshots for all 20 movements at the end of this video. So if you want to calculate your own scores to see how well your whole body flexibility score might be or how good it is, that'll be, uh, you know, at, towards the end of the video. So each of these movements was scored from lowest to highest, from zero to four. So that raises the question, what's optimal? Since it's now scored, whole body flexibility is scored, what's optimal? So one way I define that is starting off with how does it change during aging? So it shouldn't be a surprise, but whole body flexibility, as indicated by the flex index, declines during aging. And that's what we'll see here. With the flex index on the y-axis plotted against age, and this is, the age group is from 46 to 65 years. And in this study, it's relatively small, about 3,100 people. But as far as I know, there are no other studies looking at a whole body flexibility met, uh, metric index on all-cause mortality risk. So as far as I know, this is the only study that exists. All right, for both men in green and women in yellow, we can see that whole body flexibility index scores decline during aging. Also note that women at any age in this study had significantly higher whole body flexibility than the men. All right, now a higher flex index is also associated with reduced all-cause mortality. And that's what we'll see here with data from men on the left and women on the right. On the y-axis, we've got the probability of survival. So who is alive and, or how many people were alive and how many people were, had died uh, plotted against days on the x. And in studies for survival studies, we generally look at median survival this is the time at 50% survival. That's the time when half of the population has died and half is still alive. And I've indicated with the blue arrow that for the lowest flex index score, which is highlighted in red. So at that time point, 50% of that red group were alive and 50% had died when compared with the baseline start, you know, starting from the, the beginning of the study. Now at that time point, when comparing the group with the highest flexibility index scores, only 14% had died relative to 50% in the worst scoring group. And for the intermediate flexibility group, about 19% had died. So we can see that having both high and intermediate levels of whole body flexibility was associated with a significantly, significantly improved survival relative to the worst whole body flexibility index score group in men. What about in women? So first, looking at 50% survival or median survival, we can see that none of the groups made it there. So instead, we can look at 60% survival. At this time point, that's when 60% of the red group was alive and 40% had died. And at that time point, when looking at the highest flexibility uh, index score for women, only about 3 to 4% had died, whereas the lowest scoring group, 40% had died. And for the intermediate flexibility group, we can see that only about 12% had died. Again, in compared, when compared with the worst flexibility group, 40% had died. 
So here too, in women, we can see that there is a significantly higher survival, which is associated with both high and intermediate flexibility. All right, so what, is this just healthy user bias? Is this just a measure of people who have higher VO2 max and higher whole body strength, you know, regular fitness enthusiasts? Is this, is this just a healthy user bias where they probably also have a better whole body flexibility? So one way to account for that is by adjusting the survival models for factors that can impact the association. And to potentially uh, do that, they adjusted these models for age, BMI, and health status, including major diseases like cardiovascular disease, cancer, respiratory disease, diabetes, obesity, and dyslipidemia. But these models were not adjusted for fitness status. And hopefully in future studies, we'll see studies where they looked at whole body flexibility and associations with all-cause mortality risk after accounting for VO2 max and some index of muscle strength, you know, whether it's grip strength or something else. And that'll help to tease out how much of the flexibility, whole body flexibility index score is actually related to all-cause mortality risk. It may be that VO2 max and strength are better predictors and the flexibility really has nothing to do with it. So we don't yet know that, but this da these data is, are suggestive that it could be involved. Additionally, we don't know about causation. So if we improve somebody's whole body flexibility, range of motion for all of those 20 movements, do we see improvements in health-related measures and potentially longevity? As far as I know, there are no randomized controlled trials for that, so we'll have to wait for those studies to be published. All right, that's all for now. If you're interested in more about my attempts to biohack, biohack aging, check us out on Patreon. And before you go, we've got a whole bunch of discount and affiliate links that you can use to test yourself while also help to, to support the channel, including Ulta Labs, which is where I get the majority of my blood tests, epigenetic testing, NAD quantification, oral microbiome composition, at-home metabolomics, at-home blood testing with Cyfox Health, which includes ApoB, but also the epigenetic test GrimAge, green tea, diet tracking with Coronameter, or if you'd like to support the channel, you can do that with the website, buy me a coffee. We've also got merch, so if you're interested in wearing the Conquer Aging or Die Trying brand, as I've got on here, that link and all of the other links will be in the video's description. Thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.